And I'm Dinah Stevens. I am the age-friendly program manager here at the city of Seattle. And I'm going to be your host for today's Civic Coffee. And the reason we might seem slightly discombobulated this morning is because we're doing a brand new experiment where we are physically in person at the High Point Neighborhood House, which is very exciting. So big shout out to High Point for allowing us to be in their space. We have a handful of folks here with us live in person. Not only that, but we are doing live interpretation in multiple languages. And so we've got folks who speak Somali, Vietnamese, and Romo, as well as English speakers. And of course, then we have all of you online. So we really appreciate uh, your grace as we figure this out as working with community, in community, as well as online in this hybrid digital age. Which is why I'll be keeping my mask on today um, since I am in this space with many other people. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Oh, not quite yet. <laughs> so. Why don't we go ahead and get started with our, um, okay, I'm getting the green light to share screen. All right, so slideshow from the beginning. Here we go, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen for a few slides, but ultimately I'm gonna take the slides down so that we can all have a conversation together. So let me just reset here. So good morning, welcome to Civic Coffee. I'm Dinah with Age Friendly Seattle. I'm joined today by some great panelists and we have one more on the way and I will introduce them in just a moment. But we are here because October 16th was World Food Day. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in the context of older adults and why these panelists are here with us today. But first, I do want to start with the land acknowledgement, which is something the city of Seattle often does. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Duwamish people, past and present, and we honor them as the stewards of this land. And if you have not already visited Real Rent Duwamish, it might be hard to tell what I'm saying, but I'm saying Real Rent Duwamish, I really encourage folks to do so and learn more about the Duwamish tribe and what you can do to support them. So World Food Day. Every month we do a civic coffee and we focus on a different topic. It's often something topical that might be in the news or it may be a day of recognition. So as I mentioned, October 16th was World Food Day. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it's the designation when the World Health Organization, <laughs> excuse me, uh, uh, it's a commemoration of the beginning of the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is part of the WHO, or uh, the UN, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but this is really a day for us to think about food production, food consumption, nutrition, waste, and how we all uh, live in the world, that we all need food to survive. And there's a real mismatch in terms of our production, consumption, and wastage around the world when we still have so many people who are food insecure. And so we're gonna be using the word food security and food insecurity today. Um, and you know, you might be wondering, what does that mean? How can we define this? Um, I'll share that the U.S. Department of Agriculture refers to food security as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active daily life. So food insecurity can be thought of the flip side of that. So it's the lack of access or the limited ability of nutritionally adequate foods. So it's not necessarily hunger. It can be but it can also be just a lack of access to nutritious food that can sustain someone. And quite a few people in our country experience that, including older adults. About one in 15 people, or older adults in our country, experiences food insecurity on some level. Across the US, roughly 5 million low-income adults, age 60 and above, um, rely on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program in order to stay healthy and to meet their nutritional needs. And unfortunately, older adults are far less likely to be enrolled in this uh, SNAP 
Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program than other populations. So only 42% of eligible seniors are actually receiving this assistance. Thanks. Um, you might wonder what causes food insecurity, and we can talk a little bit with our panelists about that, but um, I'll provide some, some food for thought, pun intended. Um, often poverty or lack of access to economic resources can be the cause of food insecurity. And for older adults, many of them are living on fixed incomes. They may um, have to choose sometimes between nutritional food and housing or other necessities. Social isolation or chronic and acute health issues, high healthcare expenses, those can all be factors contributing to food insecurity. And of course, food insecurity can lead to poor health outcomes, everything from diabetes or obesity, gum disease, and it can also lead to increased levels of stress, the daily pressure of not knowing if and when you'll get enough nutrition um, can really take a psychological toll on someone's well-being. So I'm really grateful for our panelists for being here today to help us shed light on this issue and learn more about it, learn about some of the amazing work that's being done in our communities, and to help us learn about some of the resources that are available for families and older adults out there. So before we get going, I also want to give a big shout out to the library, who is our close partner in these Civic Coffee events. Emily Billow, some of you might be looking for her. She is not with us today, but she's on a well-deserved vacation. Um, but please do jot down her information here if you have any questions about what the library's resources are. They've got a whole section of resources for adults age 50 and above. So really encourage people to check that out. And again, big thank you to the library for helping us um, embrace today's hybrid event as well. And I can't go much further without giving a big shout out to Ella McRae, who has been an amazing partner to bring this event to the neighborhood house in High Point. She's a community builder here with the Housing Authority, Seattle Housing Authority. Um, I, I get the sense that everybody knows her <laughs> in the best possible way. And she's um, been really a wonderful partner for helping us figure out um, how we can bring this to communities in person what languages folks need access to, um, and all the logistics that go with an event. So thank you, Ella, and thank you, Neighborhood House, for hosting us. Those of you in person have been enjoying uh, food from Mojito, which is provided by Luam Wersam. Um, this is a really amazing chef and restaurant in North Seattle. And I wanted to give him a special shout out, not just because you're all eating his food, Sorry for those of you online, you're really missing out. Um, but he was able to provide food for his community during the pandemic. So he provided almost 500 meals to folks who needed it. Um, so big thank you to Mojito. And with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists before I hand it over to them uh, with some questions. So first off, I'd like to introduce Faiza. Hi, Faiza who is the program coordinator with Food Innovation Network, which is a program of Global to Local. So Faiza works in food access and she works with local food system partners here in Seattle to provide opportunities to healthy food to folks who are food insecure. Um, she's been with Global to Local for a little over two years and her work includes running a food access farmer's market in Tequila. So we'll hear a little bit more about that. And next, I'm going to introduce Fran Yates with the caveat that Fran is still joining us. And so stay tuned to see her face. Um, but Fran is the executive director of the West Seattle Food Bank. And we are, of course, in West Seattle today. Um, prior to this, she managed vocational services at the Highline West Seattle Mental Health. So she's a um, big supporter of the, oh, and perfect timing, Fran just joined us. <laughs> Hi, Fran, welcome. Very, very sorry for no, my late arrival. <laughs> no apologies necessary. We are all mm -hmm. dealing with tech <laughs> troubles all day, every day. So thank you for being here. And I was just introducing you. So perfect time to, to welcome you to the screen. Great. Well, thanks for, for putting this on and inviting us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
And last but not least, um, we have Tiffany Anderson joining us, who is a colleague of mine at the City of Seattle. And she's the retail lead for the Fresh Box program. So she's been there for over four years and loves that her work is able to help people access fruits and vegetables and that she gets to work with folks from small businesses and local growers. So with that, I do wanna pause and I'm going to ask for a signal from folks who are in the room to make sure that our pace is okay, because as I mentioned, we do have several translators. So I wanna give folks an opportunity to provide some feedback if it feels like we're talking too quickly. Okay, I got a thumbs up. <laughs> slow down a little. So that's a reminder to myself and I'll invite our panelists also to remember that we're being, uh, we're experiencing some live interpretation. So please uh, temper your pace accordingly. So I think I'm actually going to start us off with Tiffany. Um, so Tiffany, you are with the Office of Sustainability. Is it OSE in environment? Is that, I'm still learning my city acronyms. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Office of Sustainability and Environment, and you administer the Freshbox program. So can you just start us off telling us a bit about what Freshbox is? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. So some of you might have heard of Freshbox or already be connected to our program, but Freshbox is a healthy food program, and we help Seattle residents afford fruits and vegetables. So we know from working with community partners and hearing from um, people who live in Seattle that they want to eat more fruits and vegetables, but that many people find these items unaffordable. So our program is trying to help make fruits and vegetables more affordable for everyone in the city. So how we do that is we work with about 12,000 families, and they receive $40 per month to spend specifically on fruits and vegetables. So our customers receive a plastic card, or they can use a smartphone app and take, um, take those to anybody who's in our retail network, which includes all the farmers markets in Seattle, some independent grocers that are around the city and Seattle Safeways. And um, once they go there, they can pick out the fruits and vegetables that they want and use that card or that smartphone app to pay for their transaction. And my work is to actually work with the retail partners and expand our retail network to additional partners so that our customers have more choice of where to go to find fruits and vegetables. And so just a quick follow-up. Do folks ask you for specific businesses or grocers that they want to frequent and are unable to? Yes, yeah, so we um, have a couple ways that we hear from customers and community members. One is um, a couple years ago, we did a survey of all of our customers to learn about where they wanted to shop for Fresh Bucks. And part of that informed some outreach we did to new retail partners. And I'm currently working with some of those partners to onboard onto Fresh Bucks. Secondly, we have um, a phone, phone number and an email that goes directly to our customer service team and they collect feedback as well as to who um, should, be, should be invited to join our network. So those are the two main ways that we hear from people. And, and last question before I move on, if somebody wants to find out which businesses, retailers participate, where should they go? You can visit our website, which is seattlefreshbucks.org. And on that page, you'll see a link to where to shop. And that will open up an interactive map of the city. And you can enter your zip code or even a specific address, and it will show you all the retailers that are nearby. Cool. 
And quick announcement for folks on the phone and in the room. If we mention websites, phone numbers, names of resources, and you don't jot them down, don't panic. We will send out a follow-up email with all of this information in it so you can have it at your fingertips. So um, thanks, Tiffany, for all of that info. Thank you. And Baiza, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, and I want to ask you about the Spice Bridge program. So food is such, not only is it nutritional, but it's such a connective force um, that brings people together. So can you tell us about the Spice Bridge program, uh, which is home to Food Innovation Network's Food Business Incubator Program and what that is? Yeah, so um, thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Um, Spice Bridge is a food hall that's located here in Tequila, um, and it is the home to our business incubator program. Um, the program has been around for a few years, um, and the purpose behind that program really is to provide training and mentorship um, for folks who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, refugees, immigrants, um, in, specifically in South King County. Um, who are looking to start up a food business. Starting a business is hard. It takes a lot of time, energy, resources. And a lot of time, um, folks in these minority communities don't have access to those resources or to business coaches or even affordable kitchen space that they can start out their restaurant businesses in. And so this program is designed to help folks get free business coaching um, and eventually you know, once Spice Ridge only opened up two years ago. So it's really, really new. Um, and the first cohort of um, entrepreneurs in this program actually helped design um, the program and the space. And so um, it's meant to be there for a long time to allow folks to continue to come in and to start up food businesses and to get that uh, business coaching and access to resources that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and so it is a food hall. It's set up to have four different restaurants open at any given time. Um, and then we also have the commercial kitchen in the back. So um, the program right now has 10 participants. Six of them have a, a booth at the food hall. So they come in in a rotating schedule um, and we work very closely with them. Um, in our community meals program as well, which we provide free meals to seniors and youth um, and a lot of community partners. And so that is used as an opportunity for businesses to get um, some economic stability there. So we, we have grants to pay for the meals that they make and the meals go out to community for free. So when the meals, do the meals go always go out to community or do folks come into the food hall as well? Can anybody come support yeah. one of these entrepreneurs? Good question. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the food hall um, is actually open Tuesdays through Sunday for regular business. So anyone can come in and order food, food from any of the businesses open. Um, and the community meals is counted as our food access program, which is mainly what I do. And so I order meals from the businesses. Um, so I, um, Global to Local would act as the entity um, to order these meals and pay for them. And those meals always go out. So we work with um, local community partners so they can distribute to folks. Um, so what, last question to you before I, I move on to Fran. Um, can you tell us what some of the restaurants are? Yeah, oh, we have so many. Currently, the ones that have a kiosk in the space, uh, we have Moyo Kitchen. They do Kenyan Tanzanian fusion, um, really great food, and they're open Friday through Sunday. Um, and we have Terry Cambodian. Um, she does really amazing Cambodian food. Um, she's open Thursday through Saturdays. Um, we have Jolo's Kitchen, and she does Asian fusion. Um, so every week is a new kind of a new menu and she's open Sundays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And we have um, Taste of Congo and they have Congolese food, very, very, very good food. Um, and they're open uh, Wednesday, Saturday, 
Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm making myself a note to um I, I'll send you the website, the link. <laughs> We, we'll send it to everyone yes. have a reunion next next civic coffee maybe there <laughs> um and so fran I'll, i'm gonna ask you about um the west seattle food bank which you are the executive director of um a big part of older adult food security is just dietary quality and the variety of access to adequate foods um so do you carry your, I'm sorry, do you cater to older adults' dietary needs at the West Seattle Food Bank? And do you help people understand what those dietary needs might be? Um, well, we definitely really want to provide a good array of healthy food. So we're very dependent on donations we get. And a big part of those donations come through the federal government or other agencies. Um, or our grocery rescue program will go to local grocery stores. Um, but we also do spend quite a bit uh, for purchasing product and fruits and vegetables. Produce is a big part of our food purchasing budget. Um, and we do also purchase um, protein like frozen meat, tofu, when we don't get that through the donation stream. Um, so with the food bank, because things like protein are so expensive and so limited, we do limit that um, to once a week currently for families, but folks can come. We're open four days a week and folks can come and get produce and some other items um, as many times as they as they need. So definitely where we feel it's really important to get good, healthy food to the folks we serve and including seniors. Um, but another thing to consider is how, how people access food. And so not everyone can get to the food bank, you know, and certainly, you know, for many seniors, um, there may be some health reasons or transportation reasons why it's hard to access our services at the food bank. So we do do home deliveries also. Um, and we do our best to try to tailor those to individual needs. Um, so, and then, it, you know, as far as education, we do occasionally have uh, like folks that are tabling that will provide some health information. And we have in the past had worked with nutritionists to kind of help put out information um, about healthy eating habits. So I, I didn't realize that food that you distribute in the community was could be tailored to individual needs. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works or how someone might tap into such a program? Well, with our with our home delivery, we we do serve specifically the West Seattle area. And so if you're listening and outside of that, you'd want to check in with your local food bank. But for our home delivery program, when um, folks sign up, we will um, talk with them and see what we can do about um, tailoring bags that will meet their dietary needs. Um, we don't, we're not set up so that we can like each, we, we do deliveries each week. Um, so folks that are on that list regularly will get um, usually a bag of food weekly. Um, and for those that have expressed certain dietary needs, we'll do our best to see what we have available and make up the bag for that individual. Um, we're still very dependent on, you know, what we get through the donation stream, or usually when we're purchasing food, it's like giant quantities of food that will meet, because we're serving like about 2000 families a week through all our programs. So, um, so we really want to get food that folks want and that is healthy for them. Um, so conversation, if you need a home delivery, um, we will see what we can do. Um, can you share with us, like, what are the, you know, maybe top three or five items that people really want and need, especially older adults, but in general as well? Well, um, you know, it's so all over the map because, um, you know, 
preferences vary quite a bit. Um, just in general, fresh produce is a big request. And, you know, the type of fresh produce, it's so all over the map, I'd be hard pressed to pick out just a few things. Um, you know, we're again, we're buying big quantities, but we try to mix it up and get different things, you know, according to our budget. Uh, we do, so fresh produce, we, um, you know, if we're purchasing protein, it's usually chicken. So some form of frozen chicken, because that tends to um, be fairly healthy protein and meet a variety of cultural needs. Um, we also do purchase halal product, usually halal chicken um, for protein. So um, we usually folks have to ask about that product, um, but we usually have that available. Um, and then eggs have been another common thing that lots and lots of folks like to like to have. So again, if we're not getting them through other means, we're frequently using our dollars to, to purchase eggs. Yeah, interesting. And you said halal. And so I wanted, it reminded me that I want mm -hmm. to remind the people in the room watching this that the food today from Mojitos is halal. So mm -hmm. please know that. Please get up, help yourself. This is an informal space. We just talked about how food is a connector. So feel free to connect with other, other folks as you grab a meal. Um, this conversation is reminding me how personal food is. So, you know, we started with some like facts and figures, but really um, it's about, you know, our cultures, the, the recipes that we might be bringing with us from our various backgrounds that we love to share with people. You mentioned that, you know, people's preferences vary, of course, right? We don't all like the same food. So, you know, there's no um, blanket solution to food security that's gonna meet everybody's cultural and personal needs and preferences. Um, so Tiffany, I'm going to go back to you, um, and I want to ask you a little bit about the SNAP program. So this is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how the city of Seattle fits in? Sure thing. So um, as we kind of talked about earlier, SNAP is a program that folks who are income qualified can apply for, and it gives you additional dollars to spend on groceries. Um, and it's a really important program um, in terms of helping people afford um, food. And I was, I was on SNAP um, for a while and it really made a huge difference um, in helping my household help, have a food budget at all, frankly. Um, and so the city of Seattle partners with the Department of Health um, on a, a SNAP match program. And what this does is it increases a customer's purchasing power, specifically when they spend their SNAP dollars on fruits and vegetables. So there are two different SNAP match programs, and these programs operate all around the state. They're not just specific to the city. And the SNAP Market Match Program is a program at farmer's markets where customers can go to the information booth at the farmer's market, decide in advance how many SNAP dollars they want to shop with that day. And then they will receive a matching amount of farmer's market currency and they can take that currency to the different vendors around the market, choose out their produce, and um, it's a way to get twice as much food as you could normally get. So it's an amazing program. Um, a lot of people don't know about it. So if you or someone you know is enrolled in SNAP, it's a great resource. Um, there are also some supermarkets that participate in a SNAP produce match um, program that's similar but a little different. And so when you shop with SNAP dollars at a participating supermarket, um, they match for every $10 you spend on produce 
you'll get a coupon printed out for $5 off your next purchase. So another great way to stretch your grocery budget um, and to get more fruits and vegetables in your meal plans. Um, if you're curious about um, how, how to learn which markets are participating, um, we will share the Department of Health website that has more information on these two programs so you can find a place near you if you want to give it a try. That was going to be one of my follow-up questions is where can people get this? So great. So we will include that in our follow-up as well so people can figure out where to access those benefits. Um, Tiffany, at the top of this program, I mentioned that many older adults who qualify for SNAP are not currently enrolled. Do you have any sense of why that might be or, or strategies to get other folks to enroll? Sure. I, you know, we hear from a lot of people um, for a variety of different reasons that SNAP doesn't work for them or they don't know about it. I think a lot of times folks don't know about it. Um, a lot of times older adults who are receiving um, income from Social Security only qualify for a tiny little bit of SNAP. And so, you know, you have to apply. Maybe people think it's not worth it. But I think, you know, personally, when I see the price of food right now, any opportunity you have to get extra resources, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Some people think, oh, I don't really need this. Um, someone else needs it more than me. And the reality is this is a resource for everybody. And I encourage you again, if you're feeling doubtful, at least to reach out and give it a try. Um, I think, unfortunately, as a federal program, it comes with paperwork. And that's a huge barrier. So I know that there are lots of local organizations that can help people fill out that, that paperwork. And again, it's a, a place to start is if you can get someone to help support you through that process, um, it's really worth it. Great, thank you. So we will we'll compile those resources for folks. Um, so Faiza, I'm gonna turn back to you. And we know that food insecurity is greater amongst uh, old people of color. And so can you talk us through some of the unique challenges that older adults of color might face when accessing food programs, nutritional assistance? Yeah, um, I think Tiffany said it very well. Um, there are a lot of barriers. I think the biggest one is definitely paperwork and the steps you have to go through to enroll in a program so like SNAP or EBT or even um, free meal sites, things like that. Um, I think there is a misconception that all free programs or all programs where they could benefit from have all of this paperwork they have to go through. Um, I think also there are language barriers. So advertisement is then in English or maybe the top you know, few languages, but um, specifically here in Tequila, where I live and work, there are so many different people from so many nationalities, so many countries, and they don't always have access to um, the resources in their languages. And so that's a huge barrier. Um, I think that transportation is also a really big barrier. Um, at our farmer's market, we did a survey last year, um, and 60% of the folks walked over to our market. Um, and so that shows you how many of them um, live in proximity and, and don't have access to a vehicle maybe to get to places. Um, and so I know transportation is a really big, a, a really big barrier. Um, and then of course, not enough funding or programs available in the areas that they're in. Um, and I think a really, really big one is culturally relevant food. So if they go to these programs, are they gonna be able to eat food that they are accustomed to, or are they gonna be served something um, like maybe children would get at a school lunch? And I think that that 
is a lot of time a huge barrier for folks. It's very interesting. I, and, and Fran also mentioned transportation as a barrier. And when you share how many folks walk to your farmer's market, it makes me think about older adults who may be experiencing mobility challenges as they age. And if walking is their primary mode of transportation, that becomes increasingly difficult. And I imagine paperwork, when you don't speak the language that the paperwork might be in is, you know, no one likes paperwork anyway, but it can be exponentially harder when in another language. Um, so Fran, speaking of culturally relevant food, I actually have a question. I was passed a note from the other room. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that the food bank does have halal food, but can you expand on what this means? Um, is that, is it prepare, is it halal preparation or just no pork? Um, so the halal food that we would, um, have at the food bank would be like um, frozen halal chicken. So uncooked chicken that um, is certified halal by the, um, by the business or organization that we purchase it from or receive it from. So um, if folks, like if we don't have that halal chicken, some, um, some families, we, we can respond to requests for seeing if we have any like seafood or other products that would work, but we don't prepare food at the food bank. So, so if we have food that we are calling halal, it has been certified as halal by the organization or business that we purchase it from. That's good to know. So folks in the other room, I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. If not, pass me another note. Yeah, and if so, and if folks want that when they're coming to our food bank or receiving deliveries through us, um, request it and we will see um, what we can do. Okay, and I thought it was interesting too that you mentioned the intentionality that you stock things like chicken and eggs because they can be sort of cultural chameleons and be prepared in many different ways. So. Yes, that's um, also with produce. Um, you know, it, we we also are in um, a neighborhood that's very very diverse, and and we are catering to such a wide variety of nutritional and cultural preferences, and and so we definitely can't always be as specific as we like, but we definitely try to um, try to offer a variety that will meet those variety of cultural needs. Um, so that's one thing, that's one reason why we put so much of our purchasing into fresh produce, because that is um, sought out by many, although not everyone, there are some folks who we cater to who don't like to cook and would prefer to have a can of food already ready to go, that kind of thing. Um, but definitely for our purchasing dollars, um, fresh produce is the biggest um, area where we spend our dollars. Okay. I'm going to go off script with the question that just occurred to me for maybe all three of you. Um, so I did some work with an organization that did some food distribution um, in Los Angeles. And uh, one thing that they did that I thought was so cool was they tried to introduce kind of like a, a new un ingredient that might be unfamiliar to folks in each bag and a recipe to go along with it to encourage uh, cooking and, and just trying new things. Do, do any of your organizations um, do anything similar or provide recipes for folks to invite them to experiment at home? Yeah, I can share. Um, so when I first started this role, it was in June of 2020. Um, so kind of the height of the pandemic. Um, and it was my first farmer's market I ever ran. And we collaborated with Whole Foods to provide these um, pantry bags essentially for SNAP customers. And they would, it would be different every week. Um, and they would always include a recipe card because folks would say, well, I don't know how to cook chickpeas. That's not common in my culture. Or I don't know what to do with 
quinoa. I've never had quinoa before. I've never even seen it before. So that was a really good thing. And it was limited to 2020, but we work with um, King County Snap Ed and they come to our markets every year. And they also do this year, they actually did sampling. So they showed them how they made these simple recipes on site um, and also gave them recipe cards. That was awesome. Yeah, we definitely do uh, uh, at times um, have recipes for various things, especially when we're getting food through the federal government and it's a lot of a certain product that maybe certain uh, a lot of folks aren't used to using, but certain cultures maybe. Um, chickpeas is a great example of that. We were like inundated with chickpeas for a while. And, um, and so, you know, for some folks that was wonderful and they were just loving that they could get as many chickpeas as they wanted, but we were still having a lot. So um, yeah, recipes on how to use products. We don't have it all the time, but we definitely do occasionally. Yeah. Cool. Also, um, our program partners with community-based organizations that serve specific neighborhoods and communities around the city. And these organizations, um, as part of our partnership, often will provide cooking classes, other types of nutrition education and exploration. They'd sometimes do farmer's market tours um, so that people have uh, more information about all of the options available to them. Mm -hmm. And it's provided in the context and from an organization that they already trust. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And there's a shout out in the chat for the Fresh Bucks community-based organization partners. So shout out to you all. Okay, I'll go back on our script now. <laughs> um, so Fran, this next question is for you, and it's a little bit related to something I asked Tiffany earlier, which is, um, it sounds like food banks are intensifying efforts to reach out to older adults and enroll them in SNAP, and wondering if the West Seattle Food Bank is involved in any of these efforts. Um, I have to admit that pre-pandemic, uh, which is a term I seem to use a lot these days, um, we did uh, we did table a lot and have a lot of outreach around a whole variety of things, including SNAP. Um, so we are still, we're now trying to get more of that tabling going so we can bring various providers to the folks that come to the food bank so that they can sign up for a variety of programs. Um, we do have a client services coordinator uh, that's usually in the building during um, our food bank hours and she helps folks sign up for a variety of services or um, if folks don't need help signing up, but maybe just need to know where to go. Um, so she can provide information um, on those services. Um, but certainly SNAP is a really, really important service, a really important way for folks who um, are having difficulty meeting those basic needs to sign up for. And, you know, Tiffany's comments earlier about the difficulty of, you know, kind of going through all of the paperwork is a reality, but having that choice of, you know, the, the dollars to go and get what you really need, it's really important. And it sounds like there's ways to even maximize those dollars and stretch them a little further with programs yes. like the match. Yes. Um, so Tiffany, you work with businesses and I think local growers mm -hmm. uh, to get them enrolled in, in the programs. Can you talk to us about why it's important to work with folks locally here? Absolutely. So as part of the Office of Sustainability and the Environment at the city, we really think about our work as working in partnership with the whole community to create a sustainable food system. And local growers and small businesses play such vital roles in, in really grounding that work in the community itself. 
there are lots of benefits of eating local food that's in season. Um, it's more nutritious. So when something is picked when it's ripe and brought directly to market, it's had longer to absorb nutrients from the soil, the water, the sun. And when you compare the nutritional value with something that's been shipped in from a long ways away, it, it, it's much better product. So we want to make sure that our communities have access to the highest quality. Um, organic is sustainable for our environment. Um, it means that the, the food is not poisoning people or the land. Um, and so that's an important part of this work as well. And support, supporting our local farmers makes sure that that food remains here and accessible for our communities. It also makes sure that it has a lower carbon footprint, so it's not traveling as far and using up those resources. And in terms of working with small businesses and local growers, when you work with businesses that already exist in the community, they have the best understanding and relationships with the people who already shop with them. So they specialize in foods that the communities want, um, that customers shop for and are familiar with. So it's important for us to work with local businesses that um, serve culturally, that provide culturally relevant produce. Working with um, Somali business owners that have stores that serve the East African community, Latino grocers, um, that are serving um, the communities with culturally relevant Latino food. And then hopefully we're trying to expand to some Asian grocers as requested by our customers um, so that the food is familiar. And a lot of times these businesses are already embedded in other activities. They're sort of cultural hub or community hubs um, for our in our neighborhoods already where other resources are concentrated or information is shared. So it's really about creating robust, healthy communities and sustaining what's already there, which is very strong. How, uh, thinking about, you know, that these programs have been going on for many, many years, do you work with the same businesses and growers year after year do you have really longstanding relationships or is it a little more rotational given evolving community needs? It's a little bit of both. Um, so several of the, the local grocers that we work with have been partners with Fresh Bucks since 2017. And they came on board because our customers said, we want Somali grocers, we want Latino grocers, we're not finding our, our foods in the places that are already available. So some of those partnerships have been around Fresh Bucks for quite a while. And there are, as I talked about, our plans to expand to additional partners. It's in response to those community, uh, to those community um, uh, requests for like, we, we don't have any Asian specific grocers in our retail network currently. And I'm working really hard to change that for our customers. That's good to know. Um, so Faiza, this question is for you. Uh, so there can be some stigma attached to uh, food assistance programs and wondering if you think that that is a preventative factor for people when it comes to enrolling, accessing um, these benefits? Um, and how do you think we can address that? Because these are quite useful programs that many, many people can benefit from. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's an issue that a lot of communities are facing, that stigma around um, free food or um, public benefits, things like that. And one thing I think that's really helpful that we've done um, is creating um, sustainable programs that can lessen the stigma around it. So what we have been doing the last three years at our farmer's market is um, providing vouchers to folks so they can sign up for these vouchers if they're food insecure, um, but they use those vouchers 
to purchase produce. Um, and I think when folks are in spaces together, um, it helps to reduce some of that stigma. So a lot of the folks came with their family and their friends and their neighbors. That's how they heard about our vouchers. So they came over um, and now it's just another form of money, which is great. Um, and I think also what, what we did was we incorporated a mobile pantry on site. Um, so we worked with Tequila Pantry, which is just a couple blocks away from us, to give us dry goods, pantry items that folks can take, you know, for free. Um, we set up a table um, and no one was managing it because we wanted folks to feel okay to come up and take what they needed. It was pretty much on a trust model, take what you need and leave some for others. Um, and the goal behind that was because of course we're a market space and we want folks to use their dollars at the vendors. And those are all local farmers, refugees and immigrants who are selling produce. Um, so we wanted to enhance the food they were buying with free pantry items. And I think creating programs like that in the spaces that community gathers is really important. Um, because if you're bringing those things to them into their own communities and making it so that it's more of like a buyer model, um, that would help folks instead of thinking, you know, I have, to, you know, food banks are amazing, but I think folks for a long time thought like, if I have to go to the food bank, that's my last resort, but it shouldn't be, right? <laughs> it's, it's food and it's food that's accessible. So if we can create these merging models, um, that I think that would be really sustainable and great for communities. Thank you for that. And I wanna, I know, I think Tiffany, you had an accidental hand up judging by your face, but I actually do wanna give both you and Fran an opportunity to kind of weigh in on that question as well. Um, yeah, well, stigma definitely is an issue. Um, and that's why I like folks to know about our home delivery. So folks, you know, may be more comfortable because usually, I mean, it depends on um, where folks are, but if we're going to individual apartments and, and buildings, we, um, we don't use a, our van that has their logo on it and that kind of thing. It's volunteers that are delivering food. Um, and, um, you know, I agree that the variety of ways that you, um, help individuals that need additional access to food. Um, the, having a variety of ways to access that is important. So the innovative methods of like the farmer's market is just so, so cool. It's a really great model. Um, you know, the food banks, like our food bank, it's, you know, we're trying to serve so many folks. So it's when you're trying to really provide food for like 2000 families each week. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of food and you just can't specialize as you can, but what we can do is get, you know, a lot of, of product out there and available. So again, it's, a, it's an important addition. And then having the SNAP or the farm vouchers, we, we actually do farm vouchers periodically also when we when we can, or when we partner with um, another um, organization that will provide the vouchers. And so um, that allows folks to choose what they want, you know, go to, go to a farmer's market or go to some of the other markets um, to choose what they want. So definitely trying to, to find ways to reduce the stigma to get the assistance that folks need is, is important work for us all. Absolutely. I appreciate the comments um, from the other panelists and really um, agree and see evidence of a lot of these, um, these issues cropping up in our work with Fresh Bucks. We, um, in the last year, shifted to a plastic card instead of paper vouchers for the very reason that it made um, payments more discreet for our customers so they didn't have to feel as exposed. Um, I think conversations like this are extremely important because they counter the idea that we are all responsible for our, our self and our family's outcomes when in reality we exist in systems 
like capitalism that are designed to concentrate resources among a few. And so really, I just think it's important to know that we, um, there's no fault, I think, in, in where we are. There's a lot of circumstances that impact what we're able to do. And um, resources like fresh bucks, like food banks exist because the current systems that we have are not sufficient to help everybody get their basic needs. And, and so the, I think it was um, Faiza said that it's about um, a lot of times when communities come together and participate in these programs together, it reduces the stigma because you're part of something and you see that you're not alone. And I know for older adults, especially, that you can feel alone, you can feel isolated sometimes. Um, and so I think that reducing that isolation and being more connected is, is an important part of what we can do to reduce stigma. Thank you for saying that and reminding us of kind of the, the bigger world, the waters that we all swim in. Um, and Brand, I think you said you serve over 2,000 people a week. Was that, did I get the statistic right? Yeah, I mean, it goes up and down a bit, but roughly, I mean, we, we work with schools to do um, an individual pack of food for children over the weekend. Um, so that's a really small amount of food, but definitely helps for some, some children that um, mm -hmm. need that help over the weekend. But yeah, we're doing um, 15 to 2,000 households uh, a week through all our, you know, folks coming to the food bank, the individual home deliveries that we do, and the, um, and our mobile food bank that um, we have, a, our mobile food bank goes to the um, senior center in West Seattle on Tuesday morning. So we've set up a uh, food distribution at the senior center there. And then we have five apartment buildings that we um, take our mobile food bank to. So um, in those instances, we can put out the food and folks living in those buildings can just come down and then choose the food that works for them as opposed to getting an individual home delivery. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And that's just West Seattle. So yes, to underscore what Tiffany said and to yeah. destigmatize and, this. That's a yeah. lot of people accessing this program already. Yeah, we do. Um, folks can come to our food bank who are outside of West Seattle. So anyone can come to our food bank. Um, as far as our delivery services, we just don't have the resources to cover, you know, everywhere. So we try to kind of work that on a geographical basis. But but the um, Seattle Food Committee has a great website there. So if folks aren't in the West Seattle area and want to know about food banks in their area, they can access that um, website to find um, the organizations in their area. Great. Um, and I have some uh, questions for all three of you, but I think I want to just first remind folks in the room, if you have questions, feel free to jot them down. We have age-friendly staff members who can route them to me where I am huddled in a different room. <laughs> and I think we have temporarily disabled the larger chat feature because it's quite distracting to folks who are watching it live as these bubbles keep popping up. But perhaps we can enable it now if that's technically feasible. Okay, got a thumbs up. And so folks who are watching online, feel free to ask questions in the chat and um, we can invite our panelists to answer them. Um, so, you know, we talked about stigma a little bit from the consumer's perspective, but I'm wondering, and maybe Tiffany, this is a question for you. Do you face any hesitation from businesses or partners uh, in joining the program? I think, you know, um... The big determining factor for FreshBucks partners is what are the um, what are the costs of doing business that FreshBucks adds for them, 
many of them see the opportunity to support community members as a value add to their business. Um, but certainly, and this kind of highlights, I think one of the challenges that came up during the pandemic, but um, many local businesses and, 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 and national businesses too are facing things like staffing shortages and that impacts a store's capacity to take on new programs. So several of the retail partners that we had begun relationships with prior to COVID, um, for, because of the changing business environment had to pause their um, progress on implementing FreshBooks. So that's been a hard reality, um, but I don't, I don't see it as a stigma issue. It's more just the um, economic constraints of operating a business in these times. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Age-Friendly Seattle administers a discount program for older adults where we encourage businesses and entertainment establishments to sign up and offer discounts to older adults. And we've had the same experience and we want to recognize and honor the fact that a lot of businesses are, are stretched thin during COVID as well, and yet also still want to be able to provide some benefits to their community. Uh, well, speaking of COVID, um, I would love to ask kind of each of you how COVID-19 impacted your work. Tiffany, you just shared a little bit um, and, and kind of maybe also what you see as the lingering impacts of COVID-19 when it comes to your work. Not that we are out of the pandemic yet, uh, but it has certainly changed life as we know it. So that's a question for all of you. So I'll invite whoever feels moved to speak first to go for it. Um, I'll pop in first, I guess here. Um, so yeah, COVID definitely kind of blew up what we do and how we do it. And some, there are some positives out of that. And then, you know, a lot of unknowns. Um, so initially we just really changed how we distribute food. We had a shopping model that we felt was, you know, a better way for folks to come in and take their time and see what we had and take what they needed. And once COVID hit, we, we changed so many times, but first it was a box of food out of the door and that's how we were getting food and it really didn't meet folks needs. So we'd have like piles of cans outside the food bank um, that, you know, folks would take their box of food and then take out what they didn't need and take the rest away. And, you know, it was just really hard for us who, you know, we worked to try to get that need um, more, you know, just so set up services so folks could choose what they wanted. So um, we still now have our distribution. We use our parking garage right now for our distribution still because it's it's a much bigger space and and it's more outdoor. So we just feel like it's a safer place for folks. So so we still haven't brought the service back into our shopping area, which would be a lot smaller. Um, our home delivery service really ramped up. We were doing about, well, less than a hundred individual home deliveries, not including our mobile food banks um, before the pandemic. And, you know, within a year we were over 500 home deliveries each week in addition to um, the mobile food bank. So, and that, um, it, the numbers have gone down a bit there, but they're still, very, very high. Um, and it's it's a capacity issue for us about, you know, can we keep that service going? I really hope we can because I think getting food to folks for so many people is so much better than them having to come to the food bank. But, you know, coming to the food bank, there are um, there is the ability to choose what you want. Um, but one other thing is that I've seen food be distributed in many, many different ways. And I think that we're having a lot more conversations now about how we get food to folks um, and how, how we think about that and how it can work better for all. So I think that 
you know, there's there's some progress there, but still a lot more people needing the services, definitely. That's it. Just that. Yeah. I could go on for a lot longer, but I would I'm, love to hear other panelists. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, definitely. I think um, same thing for us with when COVID hit. And I, granted, I started this job after COVID, but um, I know that the market model really shifted. So I know um, public health was very strict about farmers markets and the way that they operate. And so we had to limit the mark, even though we were outdoors, we had to limit and masks were required. Um, we had to limit folks to um, two person per booth. And our market is really small. At the time, we only had three vendors. So only six customers could come in, which um, was very challenging when families would come together um, because they would meet that quota. But, um, you know, we saw a, a rise in food insecurity um, the first few months of COVID, especially as we began to realize that this was a pandemic and it's going to last longer than we had planned for. Um, and so food insecurity doubled. And I think there is a report out by um, King County that has a specific numbers. I think it went from five to 9% in King County. Um, and specifically, we work with a lot of seniors. We are actually, um, Spice Bridge, the food hall and the farmer's market is located in a, sh um, a plaza for shag. So we're surrounded by senior housing, low income housing, and those are the folks that visit our market regularly. Um, but we also noticed kind of like what Fran mentioned about, um, it's a little safer to shop outside. And I think folks, um, that's something that we heard a lot from folks that they were not comfortable going to grocery stores, even though most grocery stores were doing that early hour, you know, for seniors only, um, it, they still didn't feel safe. And so they felt more comfortable coming to an outdoor market. Um, and so that's the biggest ways that we saw um, it impacting our community and having to ramp up um, food distribution and voucher distribution and just coming up with creative ways to provide food to our community. Yeah, we saw similar um, outcomes for uh, people participating in our program. Ex extraordinarily increased demand for fresh bucks. Um, and we already didn't have enough resources to serve everyone that qualifies for fresh bucks. So um, that, and that demand lingers. Um, and then the other piece about um, changing, you know, our uh, a, a food system that relies on people to shop in person doesn't work in the ways that it used to. And frankly, it didn't work for a lot of people to begin with. Um, so I'm hoping very soon to announce a new partnership in which people can receive fresh bucks um, work, uh, can purchase from um, a, a retailer that will offer delivery. Um, so that was a, a, a definite need for this program for a long time, and COVID really intensified that need in a way that made it um, a top priority. Well, that's exciting news. Fingers crossed, Tiffany. And if and when that happens, please do let us know, and we can let folks who have joined this call as well as the wider age-friendly network know about that. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I've also gotten a few questions in the chat and via cards. So I'm going to go to those first. So in the chat, we have a question about how food banks implement language access, um, particularly situations where an interpreter might not be available and an immigrant or refugee comes in and needs help understanding the foods. So uh, this person is referencing the quinoa example, I think that you you gave for him. Yeah, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're situated in the High Point neighborhood and just through High Point and various places in West Yale, there's just a whole diverse um, set of languages. And I have to admit that that is a, uh, a process for us. I mean, we occasionally bring in interpreters. Um, we've used phone language apps um, and I, I we've been, 
starting to move towards using those phone apps more, but we still need to train more of our volunteers in, in use of those so, um, so we can get better at, at serving folks with a variety of languages. Um, we, we try to have a volunteer pool that has a variety of languages and we have, um, we have a lot of Spanish speaking staff, but not a whole lot of other languages and, you know, we're really trying to change that. So that's a work in progress, um, definitely. And Paisa, what about you? Um, it's a little different since we're not in a food bank setting, but we do have another program under Food Innovation Network called the Community Advocates, and that has been a great way for us to incorporate um, translation and language services. The advocates, um, their main goal is actually to do education around SNAP market match um, and the benefits of coming to a farmer's market and using your EBT card, your food stamps there. Um, and so we have folks from different, I think we have around nine right now, different um, ethnic communities. And so they do outreach um, in their preferred languages. Um, and we typically try to have at least one advocate at our market days. Um, and so, you know, um, I speak, I'm Ethiopian, so I speak Amharic. I can do um, rough Amharic translations. And then we'll have an advocate. Um, and we have a couple of our other staff who speak their um, ethnic languages as well. So that's been the way that we've been covering it for now. Um, but definitely we see an increasing need, especially as um, folks from other communities are now coming to our market and to Spice Bread as well. And Brand, you mentioned volunteers. So I'd, I'd like to know if you are in need of volunteers um, and if many older adults are able to spend their time with you. Um, yes, we, you, I mean, volunteers are really the main way we make all of our services happen. So really important and um, would really especially love more volunteers with a variety of language skills. That's, um, that's really helpful for us. Um, and we do, have folks of all different ages. So we do, um, we have, um, we just have a new volunteer coordinator on board. And so we usually start with an orientation and then just kind of see which of our programs and how folks can fit in. Faiza, do you also work with volunteers? Um, we haven't had a huge volunteer basis um, since the pandemic started because we weren't really sure. Um, and with market being limited, we did start it up again this year. Um, and that was through the help of the American Heart Association. Um, but we're still, we're, we're getting there. I think we do have a volunteer form on our website, which I can um, send to you, Dinah, and everyone else can have access to that. But we would love volunteers. Great. If you know, I don't know if volunteers are uh, super involved in your work, but maybe I'm wrong. Particularly, um, probably through the community partners that we um, work with. And I know that um, uh, the farmer's markets definitely involve volunteers in different ways, depending on the market. Um, so those are great uh, opportunities. Okay. So I've got a question also from the room. Um, and meet, Tiffany, this might be to you because it's a question about this, the city. Um, so this person is highlighting that living expenses have raised over, the, over time and we are unable to pay for gas, even cleaning supplies and even food, which I think is um, really emblematic of food insecurity when you're having to choose between food and other basic needs. And so they're asking, Checks from the city during the pandemic for assistance for families. Um, are you guys able to assist families in that manner or some sort? So what kind of assistance has been available from the city during the pandemic and will that continue? Yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of the programs that got stood up during the pandemic, things that um, 
for example, my office ran a, a gro an emergency grocery program that gave families a significant amount of resources for groceries. Um, programs that uh, uh, provided support to, to businesses and workers and in different ways of, of deploying income. Um, a lot of those were funded by emergency federal funding and emergency city funding that has now expired. Um, and so it is, I know it is an absolute tough time. I believe that we are all feeling squeezed financially and folks that um, were feeling squeezed to begin with, it's even more pressure. Um, the best way for you to communicate what you need and what you'd like to see the city to do is to engage your council member and the mayor's office um, because they are the ones that are directly responsive and responsible for city programming. And the you know, staff members um, for the individual programs that we run, we have some level of control. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of city programs are funded by tax revenues. And with an income, with um, with ta with sales based taxes, income's an issue for the city right now too. So it's very hard to be able to predict the future. And economics are so complicated to begin with. I can't even try to, ex you know, <laughs> guess or explain what might be happening or coming. Um, but what we hear from people is that fresh bucks is vital. And so we do everything we possibly can to protect that program and to keep it operational for into the future. Um, it's not a it's not an easy answer. I'm sorry for that. I don't have like a great like go here, go there, do this. It's um, it's you're bringing up something that I think everybody is grappling with right now. And in our follow up email from this event, we can share a few other city programs that people might benefit from, such as utilities assistance. So I know that any little bit off of everyone's bills can add up. So we'll try to share kind of the panacea of what's available. So it's 11.52, and I have a few more announcements to make at the end of this, but I'm going to turn it back to our panelists and invite you to share any closing thoughts that you want to leave us with. Um, what's one takeaway that you would like specifically older adults to walk away with today? Um, um, I think we've talked a, a bit about the stigma of needing to access services. And I just want to encourage folks that, you know, if you're having a difficult time meeting basic needs, um, please just try to take advantage of the various programs that are uh, available. Um, and I think that keeping um, city council members and the mayor informed on um, on this is is just helpful in that um, all can know how difficult it is. So access those services. Yeah, I want to definitely second that. I think connecting to as many agencies and services as possible will be the best way to go. Um, but I also wanted to add, I know it can be annoying sometimes, but when agencies provide surveys or um, community listening sessions, things like that, I think it's really important to show up and participate because um, if we don't, then agencies are going to create these programs for us um, without our input. And I think it's really, really important that um, community members are involved in the process so that the programs that we need are the ones that are being developed. And I mentioned this earlier, but please um, become familiar with the seattlefreshbucks.org website. You'll see a contact us link on that site. Um, and so you can use that link to get in touch with us, but also there's a button 
on that web page in which you can sign up for our newsletter, which is the best way to stay informed. Um, if we, for example, have new ways to connect with our program, if we have additional opportunities to enroll in Freshbacks, um, that's where we would make those announcements is via the newsletter and on our website. So I know I said that was your final closing thoughts, but I have gotten a few more just audience questions and I do want to take the time to, to see if we can get these answered. Um, so there's a, a couple more related to halal safety. So I'm going to ask those um, second. I think first, maybe this is a question for Tiffany. Could you kind of quickly walk us through again kind of gift cards that are available for what kind of foods at Safeway, farmers markets, and, and just help us digest that a little bit more. So if you are not currently enrolled in Freshbacks, we unfortunately don't have any program openings right now. Your other options that I know of directly are unfortunately limited unless you're enrolled in SNAP. And if you're enrolled in SNAP, you can go to a farmer's market and participate in SNAP market match. You can just opt in at the market booth, decide an amount you want to spend um, at, at the farmer's market and receive a matching amount on the spot to shop with. If you're not enrolled, if you're um, not shopping at a farmer's market, you can go to the Department of Health website that we'll share with you for SNAP Produce Match. And that is at participating retailers, you spent for every $10 you spend on produce, you'll receive a coupon for $5 off a future produce purchase. Those are the three programs that I talked about today. Can I just add to that really quickly about the snap market match? Um, thank you, Tiffany. Um, I know it's October, so a lot of farmers markets are closing, um, but I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, Delridge Farmers Market, it's in West Seattle. It's a food access market. Their last one is this coming Saturday, and I think it's uh, 10 to, to 2. Um, and we at Tequila also have a farmers, our final farmers market next Wednesday. But the Burien Farmers Market is open year round. And so if you want to use a stat market match at a farmers market, um, I would definitely recommend going to the Burien Far Farmers Market. It's right by their library. Thanks for that, Faiza. And if someone wants to enroll in Freshbucks, uh, is there a wait list that folks get on? If someone wants to enroll in Freshbucks, we don't have any current opportunities. Um, we are working to open an interest form on the City of Seattle's um, uh, website where you can sort of check, of, of, um, you can apply for a bunch of different assistance programs at the same time. I've heard um, the Seattle Utility Discount Program referenced already. Um, so that's sort of where, where we'll have the opportunity to share your contact information with us in the event that we have open en enrollment opportunities. Um, again, our program is funded by the sweet and beverage tax. So our program openings depend on tax revenue. Right now, we do not foresee having open opportunities in the next year but it's important for you to express that interest and get on our contact list. That form's not ready today. It will be ready sometime next year. So again, I encourage you to get on our newsletter mailing list so that you can receive those updates. We'll give you advance notice of when it's gonna open. Thank you for clarifying that. And Fran, I'm gonna go back to you for the final word. Um, can you help us understand, first of all, um, it sounds like folks have sometimes experienced finding um, outdated or expired food at the food bank, but they're not sure. Can you walk us through expiration date versus when it's safe to eat? And then also um, why not order halal for everyone? Um, because some Muslims really cannot 
eat it unless they are very certain that it is halal certified. Yes. Um, yeah, so we, so again, a lot of the food that we get is coming through donations. And so if we get like canned product that has a best use by date, um, depending on how old that date is, but it, and depending on the product, but usually if it's, you know, within a year, we may still put that out and offer that um, available because, um, you know, that the product is, is usually still good. Um, we, as we get food in, like through our grocery rescue program, we have a variety of staff and volunteers that will look at every product that comes in. So we'll get produce and this tomato is going to the compost. This tomato is good and will go out for distribution. So we try to call through all those donations and only put out what, what we hope is um, a, a good product for folks. Um, and as far as halal, I mean, uh, purchasing of the halal product is more expensive. And so that's why we wanna keep it in stock for those who, who having that halal is important. Um, uh, but for many, it, it's not so important. So that way we can spread our resources um, more broadly. Thank you for that. So it's 12.01, so I'm going to wrap up this official portion of our program. Um, this was a super interesting conversation. Thank you for the discussion and the work that you all do to bring these services to folks. Um, you know, it's making me think just this is such a, a local issue and a personal issue, but also such a macro issue. And, you know, we're all subject to food production on a global scale and the the factors that impact that. And so thank you for helping us kind of understand what that means for us on a daily basis here in Seattle. Um, so I'm going to let our panelists go and make a few uh, announcements before wishing everyone a good day. So thank you, panelists. And thank you everyone in the room and online. This was a big um, production for us to do this in four different languages and two different spaces. So um, very much appreciate all the work that went into making this happen today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. And then just a quick more few announcements. So let's see, can I move forward? I wanna make sure folks are aware of community living connections. This is a great resource if you're an older adult, someone with disabilities, or a caregiver, or a family member, or a professional working in this space. Um, it's kind of a one-stop shop to get connected to a lot of resources, not just in Seattle, but all around King County. I mentioned the gold cards and flashcards. Please do uh, let us know if you need one of these. We will gladly send you one if you are an adult age 60 and above or a person with disabilities. And if you're in the room today, we have some with us. So we will give you one on your way out the door. This qualifies you for discounts at different businesses around the city. Next Friday, I wanna invite everyone to join us at the Sound Steps Reunion. This is an event that H Friendly is supporting uh, Parks and Rec holds. They are relaunching their Sound Steps walking program. This is a, a weekly walking program. People can join walks, meet other people. It happens all around the city. Um, super great program, volunteer led. And there's a kickoff event with lunch and uh, sample walks at Magnuson Park. And if you're coming from West Seattle, there is transportation available. So uh, feel free to um, get in touch with, with us about that. Age Friendly has also got, a, is co-hosting a housing forum on November 2nd. We know housing is a major, major concern for older adults. And we are bringing together some folks to shed light on this issue and to discuss some of the innovative solutions that are out there. So please feel free to join us for that as well at Seattle City Hall. And then there's a couple events from the Seattle Housing Authority that I've been asked to share, which is Seniors Creating Art. Uh, it's a watercolor class, which sounds super fun. 
um, November 2nd through the 16th. Um, so Ella, who many of you know, uh, who has helped to coordinate this amazing event, is the contact for that. And so we can also send out information about that. And last but not least, there's a high point pumpkin hunt, which also sounds really fun. And so kids are welcome, but also older adults, because um, it's always fun to celebrate the fall this way. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next month. Take care.